So I'm Alan Ivey. And I'm Mary Bradford Ivey. And we are thrilled to be here. I have been to Oz nine times. How many times have you been there? About six times. We have been over most of the places. We've taught in Flinders. We've been to Melbourne. We've been up in Darwin. Uh, we've been over in Kiwi Island. We've been down to Tassie. We love Australia. And we feel very lucky to be with you. Don't you, Mary? I love, we love Australia. We love Australia. We almost moved there, but we got to... Too many complications with family here. Family's, too Family's here, so too far away. Every now and then we say we made a mistake. Anyway, I do want to say that Carlos Zalaket is our co-author. And why did you see what he looks like? Or you're meeting with him today. He's up and he's gone back to Tampa, and uh, he's a fantastic guy. I'm sorry he can't be with you, but he sends his greetings. So at this point, Mary is going to do, go first, and then I actually I'll actually give you an yes. overview. We're going to do basically the start. With the, we're going to focus on the listening sequence, the basic listening sequence, the, about the first five, six, seven chapters of the book, and we're going to focus particularly on attending behavior, paraphrasing, and reflection of feeling. We're going to give a little bit of attention to some other dimensions, but we've only got about 20 minutes, so we're going to have to move them along. We want to pick out these three. Not that the others aren't important, but these are three we'd see as most central. Here you go, Mary. Oh my God. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Love is listening. The picture down there is of Paul Tillich, and he is a theologian. Uh, we really admire his work, and I particularly love that statement, love is listening. <clears throat> and here to the right here, this is Carl Rogers' person-centered approach. When I was uh, getting my master's degree at the University of Wisconsin, Carl Rogers uh, was professor emeritus, and he would come back to all of our to our uh, to the university and speak to us. All of our counseling classes would be canceled and we'd go to the auditorium and hear him speak and hear him um, do his magic with listening and person-centered approach. I love this quote, uh, what he says, when I've been listened to and when I've been heard, I'm able to re-perceive my world in a new way and to go on. So he's a, he's a very special person in my life. Counseling changes the brain. Now, only this year do we have clear evidence that counseling actually changes the brain. A group of researchers in Japan found specific parts of the brain activated by our listening. These are the ventral stratum, the uh, right insula, and the mentalizing network. Now, you don't need to worry about these terms. They're going to become more familiar to you as we learn more about brain-based counseling. Um, but uh, what, what we do have is, what's important to realize is that listening is rewarding. It provides dopamine to us. It's really um, uh, a very positive emotional appraisal, and we learn to understand ourselves and others. So this is going to be something you're hearing more about in the future. Looks, oh, I forgot to show them what happened. Did you see the diagram with active listening, what happens? Uh, from my screen, I don't know if you can see that. The, um, red area with active listening. Things really light up in the brain, so that's it's really important. Here is a microscale's hierarchy that you're very familiar with. We start at the base with ethics, multicultural competencies, and wellness, and then we move up the scale. You probably have your book right there with the hierarchy sitting right there. And very important are attending skills, culturally and individually appropriate eye contact, vocal qualities, verbal tracking skills, and body language. And we move up, we're going to be talking about attend these, these areas right here, the reflection of feeling particularly today, and encouraging, paraphrasing, summarization, and obviously uh, client observation. Is there one in between there? Did we, one more there, and open and closed questions. So we're focusing on this part of the microscale's hierarchy. If you were to go to the top a little bit higher, you want to just flash on that. Remember the five-stage interview? You'd probably have that in your textbook, with relationship being most important, going right back to Carl Rogers story and strength, the goals, then we restory, and action. I always like that action part. And then we have confrontation and focusing, you know, all the different skills you've been learning about and practicing, reflection of meaning, uh, the influencing skills of feedback, self-disclosures, logical consequences, information advice, psychoeducation, and directives. And then we put it all together. Remember, different theories, different situations, different cultural groups require different skills. And it all is put together. And at the very end, <clears throat> you have your last one, personal style and theory. So you have to put and use all these skills um, according to what fits for you and what feels right for you. Okay. 
Thank you. Introduction to the basics of listing. This is what we're going to talk about today. Effective attending behavior is the foundation skill. It's essential to developing a trusting relationship with a client. I think that is so important. We have to have our basic attending skills down or, or um, you know, the rest of it doesn't count. It's so, so important. And I think many experienced professionals, you know, they're not really effective listeners. They think it's a little bit too simple for them to try, but they really need to practice on those skills. It is, it is so important. We make contact with our clients through listening and talking, as well as with our nonverbal clues. Nonverbal means the way we, the way we are as a person with the other, with our client. We need to listen to the other people because it enables them to continue to talk and explore, and that's what we want them to do. We want them to understand themselves. That's what it's all about. We want to be able to help them do that. So we have to listen to them. Anyway, we think listening is the most important skill we have in our field, and without it, we are nothing. Okay, we, have, we call it three V's and a B, a story, how microscales began. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll, okay, about I'll join you here. I hope oh, you, can, you want to move? I'll just leave it here. I'll sneak in for okay. a moment. Uh, <laughs> all of this began uh, at Colorado State University, and we'd been working... At that point, video was had never been used in counseling ever, and we were lucky enough to get a grant from the Kettering Foundation to explore how video could be used in counseling training and counseling practice. And after six months of work, we hadn't gotten anywhere at all. So then we decided, well, if we can't uh, think it through, let's just do it and see what happens. We brought our secretary, Carol, in and told her to interview uh, the student. God bless Carol. She sat there. She sat there. She looked down, she stuttered, she asked a question, and then she looked up, what should I do next? And uh, she went on and so forth. And basically, I made kind of a, what we might call an ineffective interview. If you've been to certain type of people, you know that's the way they are. So we showed her the, a video of her interview, and we said, hey, Carol, look at the person's visuals, and look at your vocal tone, relax. Stay with the topic, listen to them and just relax and share yourself openly. She went back, uh, Carol went back, and she did a great job, and we said, wow, finally we know what we're about in teaching listening skills. And that was a very important part, because video feedback is a really critical part. And I hope that you all are getting video feedback on your, on your work with attending and other skills. But the, the, the final story, uh, the final part of the story before Mary comes back again is, she went home, she came home that following Monday, and she said, Alan, I went home, I listened to my husband, we had a beautiful weekend. Okay, listing is important, listing is important. And we say the three B's and a B, visual eye contact. If you're going to talk to somebody, you need to look at them. But this is going to vary with the cultures. We worked with the aboriginals in Adelaide when we were there working at Flinders University. We worked with... Um, uh, some of the social workers have worked with some of the aboriginals, and we found that really sometimes looking side by side, they're sitting side by side, that all this is a little bit different in each culture. So you have to be aware of the culture that you're working with. Vocal qualities are important. It's the key to emotion, how you talk, the emotions that you show. That's very, very important. And verbal tracking. Don't say, change the subject. Stick with the client. Let's see where the client's going. Follow along see where they're going to take it as they explore their own issues, their own challenges. You're, you're with them as they're doing their own self-exploration. The body language is important. Again, very attentive authenticity must be true to yourself. Again, I think this is sort of a white um, European, Australian, face them squarely and expressively lean forward, facilitative, encouraging gestures and smile. Smiling helps in all cultures, don't you think? <laughs> You're pretty good at smiling. <laughs> no. But anyway, it's um, encouraging gestures to encourage them to continue talking. You want to be with the client and really yeah. show that you care and that you listen. Now, I would break in and mention briefly is yeah. that all this doesn't happen quite as fast as the aboriginal population. Oftentimes, you're going to have to spend uh, a time more traditionally or the more it is, you may have to spend half an interview just learning who the individual with the kinship is in, who they know, do you know something in common, they want to know a little bit about you, so it will be very different. Yeah, building that relationship and building that trust takes a long time, working with people of different cultures, I think, it takes much longer. Aboriginals are very relational people. Yes, they are. 
Microskills learning model, well, we really think it's important to practice, practice, and practice you. We can, here we have the five, state, state, uh, five steps learning framework. First of all, we warm up, we focus on a single skill at a time. And, and you know, when you're playing golf or tennis or playing the piano, you've got to work on single skills and then you eventually put it together, but you've got to work on skills. To be a good listener, you have to work on skills to be a good tennis player. And you have to identify it as a, as a vital part of the holistic interview. So you practice the skills to know that it's part of the holistic interview. And then you can observe a demonstration either done on videotape or maybe in your class some students demonstrate, or maybe professors demonstrate, or you, you know, it, you want to see a demonstration of what good attending looks like. And then you read about the skill or hear a lecture of the main points of effective using. So you've got all these different ways and then ideally we practice. Now we have all our little iPhones, we have our video or audio record, we can do all kinds of practice nowadays and we think it's very important to see yourself as you're, um, as you're doing these skills. And, you can, and it's also important to role play practice with observers and feedback sheets. I think that's very important too, to have your uh, students, mm -hmm. classmates give you feedback on how you're doing as, uh, as a listener. And then we want to generalize the last step, complete a self-assessment, integrate the skills and contract for action into the real world of interviewing, counseling and therapy. So that is our micro skills learning model and I'll turn it over oh, to you. Back to me. Back to you. Yeah. Right here. Let's and turn this around. Get the camera turned over or more to me. I gotta move it way over here. And Mary, I very much want you to uh, I'm right here. Ch chip in now and then you can okay. squeeze over here. Sure. But anyway, we're not gonna spend I'm not gonna spend this is just one slide and questions. I do want to say trust and relationship is necessary, especially for cultural and gender difference. I want to tell you about an experience I had with Matt Rigney in Adelaide. And I was asking a question about this and that, and then I said, well, how do Aboriginals do this, and what are your thoughts about that? But he had been around a while and had developed some trust with me. He said, Alan, he said, could you stop a minute? I said, okay, Matt, what's up? He said, Alan, you're always asking me questions, just like most white fellows do. And you know, by the time I thought of an answer to that question, you know what you've done, Alan? You've asked me another question. So, so that was a significant learning experience for me, is trust is not, not enough, and I think when you're working with a person who's culturally different, and the gender is different, and the cultural difference can be socioeconomic in many different ways, questions are always a little, tr a little tricky, so be very careful with questions, and yet you're going to find that you're going to get a lot of data out of them. But your goal is using questions to draw out the story, and if you've done the, the questions chapter, you know, these are the cr critical questions. Could you tell me what you'd like to talk about today? Who was involved? What happened? How? How are you feeling? How did that happen? And then why? I've got why is in red because it can, it can be very useful, but overused. You can put the client on the spot. Be very careful with why questions. And the, I want to bring out the key facts that tends to be for the what. The feelings tend to come from the how and the reasons tend to come from the why. So learn those questions, draw out the story, but watch out how they're used. Make, make sure you maintain relationship, relationship, relationship. Okay, I do want to say what relationship will do. And this is our potential impact with the relationship on neural development. If you look on the left, uh, you'll see some branching coming out of that neuron. And after counseling, we actually produce new neurons. So just for listening, you can produce new, new neurons in the brain. And if we, you see repetitive stimulation, if you ask the person at the end of the, view, in, end of the interview to do something to generalize and follow up what's learned in the interview, that's the repetitive stimulation. And that means that the new branches of the neuron are, are going to last much longer. On the other hand, think about the whole issue of sometimes clients will come in with neurons that aren't necessarily useful. And we'd like to extinguish those. And so on the left, you can see what pruning can do with neurons. So sometimes we'd like to increase neural development. Other times, like getting rid of ineffective uh, thoughts, uh, uh, feelings, and uh, feeling negative about themselves. We'd like to prune those negative neurons and build those positive ones. It's called operization in the technical name. And it's also what we call brain plasticity. Our brains are constantly developing new neurons 
and new neural networks. So you have a big impact with these listening skills and the other skills that we talk about in the book. Now, a little bit more about paraphrasing. Paraphrasing shows that you've heard what the clients are saying. Add the minimal courage to use more. Paraphrasing, of course, is just saying, not just, it's saying back what you heard the client say and clarifying it, often just stealing it and making it just a bit shorter. And the minimal encourager is, it turns out that uh, the more experienced the counselor is, they tend to do more of these minimal encouragers, which means head nods, but don't bomb, <laughs> and uh, smile, these, and tell me more. Uh, lean forward. These are all minimal encouragers that help the client talk and bring out content. Paraphrasing is really good to elaborate the story and bring out cognitions. Cognitions are basically located in the prefrontal cortex. We'll say a little bit more about that. And so they're really critical to bringing, bringing out the story. Uh, paraphrasing is really a central aspect. So questioning and paraphrasing are really very good ways to bring out the story. Well, let's take a look about it. Okay, here we see the brain, and you see the PFC, prefrontal cortex, and this is what the this is where <clears throat> the skill of paraphrasing and summarization are particularly helpful. The PFC, the front part of the brain, uh, you see the PFC, you see down there, prefrontal cortex. The piping isn't quite as large as you might like it to be. That's where you make executive decisions. Also. This is where the, the brain regulates emotions. So, the, so the executive decisions, making deciding what to do. Clients come to decide, and you want to strengthen that. And emotional regulation, you've got a client with impulse control who's depressed. You want to help them learn how to emotionally regulate. That tends to be important in the paraphrasing, but even more important when we talk about later about feelings. Now, all of us now need what we call cognitive reserve, and that is it is emotional, but by the way, it's primarily cognitive, the prefrontal cortex. And we build prefrontal cortex by, and, and what that means is more neurons in the PFC, uh, by listening and by helping persons learn new skills, do things more effectively. I just mentioned briefly, uh, in the center of the brain is this thing called the amygdala. And those of you who had bio, you're, you're saying, of course. I describe this, we describe this as the energizer bunny, because that's kind of, Data comes in there and it decides where it's, what's going to happen, where it's going, not where it's going to go. They decide that it's interesting enough to impact the rest of the brain. And it's much more complicated than just the amygdala, but it's a real central issue in stimulating, stimulating things. And by the way, if you're going to have a, if, if you think about yourself going down the road and you see a person cuts in front of you or swerves in front of you, the amygdala is also a protector. It will override the PFC, and we want them to override the PFC. It's very, very effective at making instant decisions without thinking. So the amygdala, the energizer bunny, well, it's also heavily concerned with fear. So in fact, the reason we swerve is because of fear. Our more challenging negative emotions tend to be associated with the, neg with the amygdala. Uh, what we'd like to do, again, is strengthen the executive prefrontal cortex of effective counseling. And you don't need, you'll learn eventually, I think, later on in your lives about the thalamus, the ACC, and the PFC. Uh, keep in mind this little center called the nucleus accumbens. That's the pleasure center and brings out the dopamine, which is fun. And the, fundament, the fun aspects of life is get a shot of dopamine. You don't want too much, but you do want to have enjoyment. And also, what happens with drugs, this is the downside, is drugs provide, for example, cocaine gives about eight times the amount of shots of dopamine to the pleasure centers that sex does. So think about drugs as a, as a real reinforcer that is very dangerous at times. A quick summary of paraphrasing. I said this would be quick. Uh, very important to personalize counseling. Uh, I think including the, use their name, George, uh, Harold, uh, Luis, uh, Suzanne, uh, et cetera, use their name and personalize frequently, including you, rather than just being bland. Mm -hmm. Note and note and key note the key client words. Note and key the client key words. Certain words will be said a little louder, and they are the important one. Look for the certain words. And often it's just useful to use a minimal encourager around 
You said sad. Tell me a little bit more. You say fight. What, what kind of fight was it? That's a key word. Help elaborate key words that bring out key dimensions of the story. Clarify and distill what's been said and catch the essence. Check out the accuracy. Is that right? I heard you correctly. Just don't say it. Anthony, I hear you saying, and just or just say it back. You don't have to say that. Don't say I hear you saying every time. That can be too habit forming and turn off them. But it can be a useful way. Seems like, etc. Other ways to begin that paraphrase. Ah, okay. That's the quick summary, and that brings out the cognition. So now, I'd like to go to what we see is really increasingly central to the counseling practice. The artistic counselor catches the feelings and emotions of the client. Our emotional side often guides our thoughts and actions, even without our conscious awareness. Now, first of all, you've got to attend. You do want to bring out the, through the questioning the content and the paraphrase and make sure you have clarity. But until you tune in with the feelings, the change is going to be much more difficult. Uh, comparing paraphrasing and reflection of feeling, paraphrasing focuses on the content and clarifies what has been communicated. We have a glass of water here, sorry. <laughs> reflection of feelings focuses on the underlying emotion and helps the client make his or her emotional life more explicit and clear. Both important, they work together. Listening equals learning. Now, we saw the PFC, now we're going to look at the limbic system in the center of the brain. And there you get the activation of the amygdala, emotion, and the memory in the hippocampus, and the protective system, as I mentioned. And body regulation, we have thought regulation and emotional regulation of the PFC, but we have uh, body regulation and action in the amygdala. The brain don't always works together. And it's fascinating to mention, it's become really critical and very cutting edge stuff is now going on. I am <clears throat> giving most of my time now to looking at how neuroscience relates to the counseling process. The delightful thing is we find that the micro skills are right there. What we've been doing with listening skills and the various skills are very important in brain development and building new neural networks. Uh, the goal, and this depends on the PFC again, is awareness and regulation of emotions. And the limbic system is where you have fear, sad, and mad. Uh, you know, sad, mad, glad, and fear. Uh, fear tends to be the central emotion. Sadness really is a variant of fear. Mad, angry, also is a variant of fear. Fear is really the basic emotion in the amygdala. Then you have the HPA axis, which you'll hear a lot about as you move later into the field, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenals the hormones and the neurotransmitters which makes things happen. Reflection of feeling. One, observe the feeling. Mm -hmm. Two, and name it. Mm -hmm. Three, repeat it to the client. There are explicit feelings. You want to hear feeling words. A lot more often than not, perhaps they're going to be implicit. You're going to see the nonverbals, and you're going to see mixed feelings. And mixed feelings, by the way, are the ones you really want to tune in with because that's why they're coming in for counseling. I really like my parents, but... Uh, my wife and I are, are getting along. My, okay, let's I can say it in a way that <clears> might get it. My wife and I are getting along just fine, just fine. You know, just fine. Uh, I really, I really like my wife. You know, you hear, you hear that. Look for those mixed emotions, and then what you want to do is pick out the two sides and help them balance with the two sides, and then put them together in a more unified sense. Search for the feelings. How comfortable are you with emotion? Think about yourself and your own personal style. If you're not comfortable with emotional expression, guess what? Your clients aren't going to be comfortable either. <clears throat> Was discussing feelings and emotions part of your experience growing up? If not, then you need to start working on them, be able to recognize and deal with emotion. If you can't deal with emotions, uh, your chances are you're going to be a much less effective counselor. Observing them, the verbal behavior, the words they use, the nonverbals, and look for discrepancies. Uh, for example, the person might say, I'm feeling very comfortable while the hand is clenched. Or they might close put their arms like this. I've, I'm really totally open. Those are the discrepancies and mixed feelings you're going to see nonverbally. 
So we do want to search for those discrepancies, incongruities, mixed feelings, contradictions, and that critical word, conflict. I feel this, she feels that, he feels this way, I feel this way. The techniques, pretty straightforward. On the other hand, uh, doing it is choose a sentence then. I hear you feel, I think you feel. Uh, Stem is optional, pinpoint. You feel sad, mad, glad, identify them, use it. When, when in brief segment of context, when A, B, or C happens, and use appropriate tense. You feel this right now, you think you're going to feel, uh, you felt this way in the past. But the most powerful one is when you say you're feeling angry right now, you're feeling happy right now, you're feeling confused right now. Uh, those here and now present tense emotions tend to be the most important and the clue to problem resolution. Resolution of challenges. I don't like that word problem, still flips in. We're working with challenges and not problems. And check it out for accuracy. That's the skill. And you go through that again. Sentence stems. I hear you say, you feel, feels like, you feel sad. Mary, it looks like you're happy. I like yes. that spot. <laughs> Uh, pinpoint and label, use accurate feeling words, get a feeling, develop a feeling character, use more than one feeling word with mixed emotions. Precision and accuracy are key. And that checkout, is that close to what you're feeling? Is that word catch where you are right now? It's really important to check out the feelings because if you're wrong, they will usually help you and correct. Don't you think? They will help you and give you the correct feeling. Yeah. And use a statement with Context, you feel mad, sad, glad, scared, because. Mm -hmm. And use a pension tense, I've already said this, reflections in the present tense are most impactful. You felt, you feel, you think you were feel, past, mm -hmm. present, future. Here and now, right this moment, you're really mad, sad, glad, angry, because. And check for accuracy. You seem angry today, am I hearing you correctly? <laughs> uh, or you seem angry today. I'm hearing you correctly. In other words, don't reflect the anger in your own voice. <laughs> Be a little more neutral than I was right there. <laughs> and the place of positive emotions. Counseling too often focus on difficulties, blocks, and problems. Positive emotions broaden the scope of people's visual attention, expand the repertoires for action, and increase their capacity to cope in a crisis. What are the strengths that the client brings to us? They produce patterns of thought that are flexible, creative, integrative, and open information. You want to actually work to overcome negative thoughts and feelings. I'm going to bring Mary back here at this particular point, and let's, let's talk together about the oh. base supply because we really think this is central. I, well, we both we both think we want to we think it's important to emphasize the positive emotions and things that are happening that are positive in the, in, in the client's life. One thing that's useful to do is go back and ask for positive experiences, places where they felt good, places where they felt comfortable, search out people that helped them. And you can think about the whole fact that uh, I would tend to spend, uh, for me, I tend to spend in an interview much more time on drawing out strengths and resources that I do in problems and concerns. You really, you can really only solve your only problem. You could solve your problems and concerns with your strengths. I mean, you're not going to go at it with your negative aspects of your life. You want to want to find what they're strong in, and then focus on that and help and use that to overcome their uh, challenges. And if you can't find something positive in the client, you should refer. You should refer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, sad man squared is one way to organize a language. Emotion. Uh, we need more attention to glad words, more attention to the positive words. You know, if you've ever done that game of listing all the different words, notice, notice that sad, mad, scared, those are kind of negative emotions. There aren't as many positive. It's hard to come up with positive ones, but we must come up with them. Such as please, happy, contented, together, excited, delighted, pleasure, and the like. Located primarily in the PFC, prefrontal cortex. So think about positive emotions and try to intersperse the positive emotions when you're dealing with your client. And if you want to keep a client coming back for years and years and years, uh, you work, they'll work with the limbic system and they'll find a problem. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Next week the client will have a new problem and a new challenge and a new concern. Mm -hmm. And they'll come on forever. Victor Leong, Victor Yalom, who's supposedly a great, wonderful counselor therapist, very famous, he talked, when I heard him last, he talked about a client that he had for 28 years. 
I have a hunch that, uh, yeah, Victor was... 28 years, I know, that's a was, long time to know. I think Victor's very good at locating problems and keeping clients at great profit for a long time. Mm -hmm. I hope that you'll work with, work with the positives. The place of positive emotions and reflecting feelings. Pleased, happy, contented, together, excited, delighted, pleasured. I love all the pictures of the uh, faces, the smiley yeah. faces. And I think take a moment now and think of a specific situation when you experienced each of the positive emotions listed in the previous sentence. That's a good way. You try it yourself. See how you feel about those those things and, and see if your client can talk about a time when they're happy, when they're excited, when they're pleasured. But, you know, let them talk about some of these positive things. Don't make constantly just a negative experience where we deal with problems. Yeah. If one way I do in a class, I don't know how it works here, if I say, no, 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 I don't know how it works with you, but I do find that the students move back often, physically move back, and they find their heartbeat increases a little, their breathing changes. And then if I say, yes, uh-huh, yes, yes, they calm down. Mm -hmm. And the whole the thing is, the client will have a bodily reaction to what you say. I strongly recommend against saying, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to do that to illustrate mm -hmm. that uh, positive emotions actually happen not just in words, they happen in the body. Okay. Emotion, emotion, that actually is a, they come from the physical part of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the short, be happy, and help the client be happy. Right. Positive, go ahead. Okay, positive feelings lead to resolution of client issues, but do not focus on the positive to the exclusion of focus on negative emotions. So you don't want to forget the other emotions. Be afraid to allow the clients to express or explore negative emotions or minimize the difficult emotions too quickly. So you don't want to do that either. So it's, it's, a, it's a fine line that you have to walk. Allow them. In other words, don't get so positive you're in Pollyanna. Yeah, right. Clients need to tell their stories, even if negative. We can do positives later on. They've got to share their issues. <laughs> yeah, they uh, do. So the summary combines facts and feelings from recent conversation at the beginning or end of a session. And the summary puts the story together. You want to bring the facts and feelings, emotions, and facts together in a summary statement that helps them organize their thinking. And by the way, a very good strategy to use is to ask them to summarize what happened in the session. Well, what have you learned from the session? What have you learned from the session? Kind of thing too. Or sometimes at the beginning of the session, you know, to start out and say, this, this is what I heard you talking about last time, or can you tell us what you talked about? or What stood out for you? What stood out for you? So you, the two of you that, kind of come to a summary together. Yeah. I think that's very effective. One thing I like also at the end to say, or among what have we missed? Yes and take a moment for them to put together things they wanted to say but couldn't get or things yeah. that were more important. I also find that what we think is the most important thing in the session is often not what the client thinks is that most is, important. That is really and interesting. In that sense, we ought to go back to Carl Rogers and there's such things as authenticity, mm -hmm. positive regard, respect, mm -hmm. and yourself as a human being is the thing that's going to make these listening skills work. So there's your micro skills hierarchy again. Tending behavior, reflection of feeling, open and close questions, and then stop here with relationship, relationship, relationship. That's yeah. you want to yeah, establish absolutely. a solid relationship. Right. Draw out a story and strength, find the client goals, restory and action. Right. And if you don't a, two, a lot of time people will stop with the restoring. And actually, unless you contract for the client to follow up, this is mm -hmm. where Albert Ellis was really, really useful. With the he, homework, yeah. With the homework. <clears throat> like, what are you going to do between now and next week, or the next time we get together? Yeah. What, what's going to happen? What are you going to try to do? So you have a plan, and then they uh, take action with that plan. The other thing we learned, this from Leah Capellas, uh, when we were teaching at Flinders in Adelaide, mm -hmm. Uh, we've always emphasized goals. One thing that Leah did, uh, she had every client she worked with uh, establish a set of goals for the interview, concrete, clear things. And that became a written contract that they worked on. Yes. And the yes. counseling was only effective if the client met their goals. That was very good, very helpful. Action. Action. And then you got the rest of the hierarchy. And yeah. I'm going to go back there just for one moment. Uh, Determining your personal style and theory, you're going to have a chance later on to get at the influencing skills and strategies 
reflection of meaning, and good stuff, but it doesn't, none of that makes any sense unless you listen. Unless you have a relationship. Yeah. You gain a relationship through listening. Yeah. So at this point, oh, micro skills and research. Significant research, 450 studies, boils down to these five key points, six points, five points. Expect results if you do use these skills, something practice. will happen. Practice. Practice, practice, practice. If you practice. don't practice, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Multicultural differences are real. Don't blindly apply these skills. Mm -hmm. Look for individual and cultural differences. Right. <clears throat> different patterns, different theories have different patterns of skill usage. Criterion theory will do a lot of listening. Right. Psychoanalytic will do a lot of interpretation. Solution focus, probably more questions. More questions. Yeah. And, and yeah. specific micro skills result in predictable client responses. You'll see that in our work. Yes. Research leads to action. So there we are. Yep. And I guess now we're going to have some questions from Pedro. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I just wish we were the down there with you, even though it's coming on your fall season. <laughs> What if a client gets violent? Oh, oh, oh it's not an easy one, huh? Not an easy one. Huh? Uh, I think that uh, it's very important to make sure, if you anticipate that happening, keep yourself in a safe situation. Right. Uh, I think uh, if, if you suspect anything happened, the step one is keep that door open. Uh, mm -hmm. Step two is... Uh, I've never had one get violent. No, no, but uh, you know, if I you're had people in a, threaten violence. Right. You're in a working in a group situation. You'd want to contact some of your colleagues there or get help. You know, if you're working with a group. But. I think it really depends on how immediate the situation is. If they're immediately violent, you're going to. I, I think the only answer is get help as soon as possible. Right. And uh, that thing, ideally, don't look threatened. And I remember the time. <laughs> You're going to be threatened sometimes. I remember when uh, I was at Colorado State University and I called up in the middle of the night and we had a guy uh, with a gun on his wife and I remember walking in to the, uh, in there and I felt I wasn't exactly fully comfortable as you might imagine. <laughs> and uh, then my main visual memory is of the, of the gun fortunately sitting against the wall, which I found immensely reassuring, but the gun was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did have Doug Forsyth, a very dear graduate student of ours, with me, and we both were surprisingly calm. I think calmness is the best advice we can get. Don't get excited. And uh, call, if you get excited, excitement begets excitement. Right. Calmness yeah. and assuredness in, in, in these difficult circumstances is, I think, the best we can say at the beginning. And uh, if it really gets dangerous, you're going to have to get help as quickly as possible. What would yes, you add, I, I think that um, you might think ahead if you have a client that might be might uh, be dangerous. You might think ahead and have a plan available, or yeah. you know, know somebody, or in a group, or just if you're all scared, afraid going into the situation, you have to have sort of a plan in your back pocket as to how what's going to happen. Yeah, not fun. Sure. No. Yeah, I guess the basic uh, for most counselors or, or therapists out there is definitely um, to have a plan of action. Uh, mm -hmm. Plan of action. What can yes. I do? If something like that should happen. Excellent. Uh, thank you, guys. Now, another question from Michelle. Um, how can you help someone who is battling an addiction? Oh, yeah. well, you they only have, have they're only asking the easy questions. <laughs> we have a presentation we do on addiction. <laughs> a presentation on addiction. You want, they want the uh, short answer. And the, I'll start a little bit, and Mary's going to add. Uh, Mary's done a lot of workshop in drugs and drug education. Uh, we have slides that we could bring out uh, on on drugs. And the thing is. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think well, the first thing you need to do is understand, remember what I said about co cocaine, uh, marijuana also increases the pleasure chemical dopamine, uh, and what we have also is THC and ketamine, which are kind of, and, and then we have a varieties of artificial uh, marijuana, which are much often, you typically more powerful than marijuana and more right. dangerous. And they cannot make those, they can make them illegal, but uh, all I got to do is change one chemical mm -hmm. bond, I get the same effect, and uh, 
So we're going to have drugs around for a long time. And I, I anticipate we've, we've legalized them and moving toward legalization here in the States. Uh, what we're going to find, uh, it's, and actually there's going to be more business for you just plain psychologically. Mm -hmm. Netherlands, and actually it's been repeated now in several, several places, that uh, a strong increase in psychosis comes with us. If a person is vulnerable, uh, the chances of psychosis are really greatly increased with the use of uh, drugs, marijuana, even, and, and it includes marijuana. Mm -hmm. Marijuana is not a gentle drug, although people would like to think so. I'm in favor of medical marijuana, but teen, teen brains are not really able to take it. The teen brains are not myelinated, and, and they are going to be very affected. Some, some can to the point of psychosis, the uh, body percent go into psychosis from using just using marijuana. So, it uh, I think um, you have to team with somebody who is, or you know, be uh, be aware of the referrals in your area for AA or the drug program, any all the different programs available in your community, and connect with those people because. Uh, that's that's pretty that's pretty specialized and that's, unless that's your area. It's specialized. On the other hand, you yeah. figure about half the people you see will have what they call dual, dual diagnosis and they have some approach to addiction problem. Yeah. I don't mind saying that we've had addiction problems in our own family. Fortunately, not us. But very difficult to work with. One thing you want to do is build as much family support. And interestingly enough. Uh, for alcohol, uh, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous is very effective, yeah. but not for everybody. Each person needs an individualized folk. Mm -hmm. Albert Ellis developed an approach from rationally motivated behavior therapy that was quite effective. Again, not effective with everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the basic principle is going to sound naive. It goes back to find an ultimate way to find life reinforcing, to make it pleasurable, uh, so they don't have to get the dopamine and the nucleus accumbens stimulated by drugs. Yeah. That's that's the basic simple answer. Now getting there is a whole massive different thing. And we uh, we need a lot more work in understanding addictions. Uh, I'm fast. We got one slide I find particularly fascinating. Uh, and that is you see the chemical structure of uh, uh, what's happening to the brain? I'll let you finish. No. Well, I would say what's happened to the brain when 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 they're under drugs. We've got these slides that just shows exactly what happens when uh, when drug usage is. I mean, the brain just tunes out. I mean, you you, you know, you just lose some of those neurons when that's going on. And um, I don't know. Maybe you should show the client some of those slides of what's happened to their brain that might oh, actually help them of, think in, that in, not to yeah, use drugs. Good point, Mary. <laughs> use some of those. In, in general. Uh, yeah. I'm recommending that as you get a little more conversant with the brain neuroscience and neurophysiology that you yeah. have a picture of the brain in your office or at least a, a, available and say to the client, hey, we're going to work here to strengthen your brain. Yeah. And and for the person that's going to the drugs, this is yeah. going to happen to your blood and drain. We have slides which show yeah. uh, what cocaine looks like. I almost feel like we ought to pull it out and show it. Show. <laughs> oh, no. Hey, we could go on a long time. Yeah. But you see, you get the general point. We think it's an incredibly important question. Yeah, it's and those are just some very beginning suggestions that we have an hour, a half hour presentation to do on it. But thank you for asking. Thank you. Okay. We have time for a couple of more questions. You hear thunder hey, in, the thunder. Thunder a, in the background? Thunder in the background. This is our first rainstorm thunder for about a month. We, we haven't had any rain here in Florida. Wonderful. Uh, all right. So another question from Bountai is, do counseling sessions have to be within an inside environment, uh, such as a room, or can it be outside walking? Um, I ask as children are not always willing to sit still and talk yet they're actively doing something, they seem to talk more. I guess that when yeah. play therapy comes in a lot, so. Um, well, you can an animals, hey, this is a question I'm I asking. loved, I loved, I worked with children for a number of years of my life as an elementary counselor, <clears throat> and I loved doing what we call walk talks, and we, I, you know, these kids with ADHD, they couldn't sit in the office. So, I mean, I would take them out, we'd walk down by the river area, or we'd go play basketball, and you know, when they're active doing something or when they're walking, I mean, they're much more comfortable than when they're just sitting. And even if I'm just sitting in the office, I have them doing something with their hands with Play-Doh or magic markers, colorful, smelly magic markers, doing all kinds of things or games. Uh, it's hard for children particularly and some adults to even just sit there and talk. It's, it can be very challenging. So 
I think you can be creative, and I think uh, lots of good things happen on walk talks. I think they're great. Yeah, I'd add, I'd add to that for adults. I think that isn't just having a tissue in the paper. I honestly think there should be things for people to fiddle with their hands. I think there's uh, yeah. mm -hmm. a variety of things that people want to do. People, a lot of people like to multitask and just sitting and talking, uh, particularly for teenagers, a little bit challenging. Yeah. So have something for them to do more rhetorically. And the thing is, I think we're far too much in the talk, the actual yeah. involving. Now, also that means, uh, for some, and it depends on you, but art therapy, in other words, have, have the, uh, art therapy works. Uh, music is very good at bringing out emotions. Some of you are going to be very skilled mm -hmm. at bringing music in to as part of your session. Some of you will have it as a background. Some of you will have play something and ask your clients to respond. Uh, drawing is fun. I think drawing, drawing is very, very relaxing for, for many. You have to figure out what works for each of your clients, but drawing can be very effective. Yeah, in other words, if you just yes. do talk, 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 you're working with that PFC and mm -hmm. Olympic system, but use the motor system as well and yep. bring it in. I think yep. that's a great question. And, you know, use the breathing exercises, the relaxation at the beginning, if that seems to be helpful. Breathing, meditation. Yeah. Meditation, yeah, all those uh, things. Also, by the way, we learned sand tray work down in Australia at a yep. workshop. That was marvelous. And now it turns out that sand tray work was surprisingly well with adults. Yep. So. so an Oz intervention works. <laughs> so next question. <laughs> okay, Ooh. wonderful. The questions are coming in a great, a great variety, by the way. Um, the next one is, uh, what if a person, this is from Elizabeth, um, what if a person refuses to admit that they have a challenge and continually blame others? They don't, they blame others. Blame and they, others. they don't admit that they, they, they continue to blame others. Oh boy. So you've got a problem with percep uh, perceiving the point of view of the other. Yeah. Uh, particularly if you've got a narcissist, I go, oh. Yeah, it's because hard. narcissists are incredibly good at not seeing the perspective of the others. Anti-social kids, conduct disorder kids are a real problem because they literally cannot see the skill that what's going on in the other. And what, what happens, there's what they call mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are the basic part of the brain which enables you to understand what's going on in the mind of another. I also call it theory of mind. And you find that that's a critical as mirror neurons are critical empathy. Well, it turns out uh, with antisocials and conduct disordered children, I'm sorry to say, mm -hmm. their mirror neurons do not fire. And so they actually, and I guess what? They don't have empathy. <laughs> they don't have empathy. Yeah. And I talked about cocaine giving pleasure. Guess what gives the antisocial pleasure? Other people in pain. Yeah. They actually get a dopamine kick from seeing somebody else, somebody else hurt. They are probably the most difficult people to deal with, too. In other words, incredibly difficult. Very difficult. Uh, now, having said they're difficult, uh, working with them, for, one of them, of course, is also that you really work with somebody like a criminal personality, uh, Norma oh. Cluxter, whom you worked with, was very, very good at working criminal personality, mm -hmm. very good at establishing relationships. You know what Norma often found? She'd do all this work to establish a relationship, things were going beautifully, and then the client left therapy. Why? Because they can't stand being close. They're so afraid that their attachment will be broken, so they, they break it before you break it with them. Yeah. They've been hurt so many times. That's what she found working with these criminals. So it's uh, definitely a challenge. Okay. <laughs> and then what I, I remember working with the VA with one of those people, <laughs> and this is what I did, and it worked. Uh, he, he was running McDonald's, uh, and he was a veteran, but he got fired because he was hitting his employees. And so I listened to him. He says, why, you know, why are you hitting? Well, I want to control them. And I said, control? Tell me more about control. I picked the key word control. And so he told me about why he liked to control other people. He said, you know another way you can control them? By listening to them. And my time listening skills, well, that's a great way to control. And it was partly helpful in getting him out of the hospital. So in uh, effect, uh, some of these positive things, uh, others is real value in, in, in teaching perspective taking mm -hmm. and uh, learning that there are other other ways to uh, other people see different things and if they can't see the perspective of the other uh, I think it might be useful to take two people an example and have them just work on the idea of perspective taking maybe even teach them the concept of 
you look at it this way, you look at it that way, different people see the same thing differently. And that's a kind of a core principle, hard to teach, because we got a lot of them in our, in our country, they belong to a certain political party I'm not going to name, <laughs> and they are very low in empathy. Uh, when they see, uh, well, actually I'll name them. When a Republican sees a person who's a person of color, their brain fires really in a more negative way than liberals do. Uh, so, in effect, your brain fires differently if you're if, if from people whose perspective is different from yours. So it actually is, to some extent, hardwired. I hope uh, <coughs> we're getting off. I'm getting off the wrong. Topic I know. <laughs> I know. Just dangerous, dangerous. <laughs> wrong topic. I. Uh, and lots of lots of good Republicans. <laughs> and, and, and 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 even George Bush was very good with AIDS. <laughs> And he did wonderful work in Australia. So even the most conservative person does have often have some sense of empathy and caring. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> okay, so one final question as uh, we have some time restraints uh, and Mary and Alan need to probably cover their pool before it gets destroyed by the storm. <laughs> um, so this one is a, a, an interesting one, uh, especially considering uh, how much experience you guys have got together, so you've been in a good position to answer that. How do you set aside your personal judgment and maintain a professional approach to a client when a client's situation is against your morals? An example would be domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, step one, you, don't, you really don't approve of it. Domestic violence. Uh, mm -hmm. There is, as Adler would say, logical consequences. If mm -hmm. you're going to do this, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a definite place uh, for laying out rules. I think mm -hmm. that a real challenge is uh, with the domestic violence, by the way, is with the uh, woman, it, she is often so tired economically to the husband, it's mm -hmm. very hard for her to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just at a we just worked with Family Promise, a group of, of uh, people in our community go from church to church and they, uh, the woman's husband uh, was violent and ended in, happened to be in jail now, so they felt rel relatively safe, but they would, they're in a program for three months. Well, well first of all, they churches. lost, because, yeah. he, because, he, because he ended up in jail, they lost their income, their home was foreclosed, she'd right. always been a single parent. No, she hadn't been a stay, she'd always been a stay-home mother. Stay-home mother, I'm sorry. Now yeah. she had to be a single parent with five children. So and work. And work, and and you know it was a real, you know, it was a real challenge. The domestic violence things are very difficult. We've had, we had a woman come to our house, uh, one night, and you know, and we had to get find a safe place for her, safe house. Uh, they need to get to safety if they're in a dangerous situation. Help people find mm -hmm. places. Again, knowing the community resources and where people can go for help is very important. This could be a real challenge. Uh, because yeah. some agencies emphasize professionalism and boundaries, and uh, I remember Elsa Orwella, a wonderful uh, Colombian student, uh, and Elsa had a, per a woman come in that had been abused, didn't have any place to go. So Elsa got on the phone and found a place for her to stay, took her over to the home, mm -hmm. and saw that she was safe for the night instead of a follow-up. She got in immense trouble with her supervisor who said you broke professional boundaries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this type of thing, uh, of course, made me rather unhappy. Mm -hmm. At tradition in our profession, you've got to be basically wound up rather tightly. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes we're going to have to move beyond traditional professionalism to make sure people are safe. At the same mm -hmm. time, moving beyond the boundaries, which mm -hmm. frankly can be dangerous mm -hmm. and gets you in trouble. Right. Right. So you always have to be careful, and for goodness sakes, if, if you're a mm -hmm. male, uh, never take, for example, a male should never take that woman to the safe house. It's no. got to have another woman with her. Yeah, uh, absolutely. 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 And uh, what was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> but basically, what, going on what, do, what do you do with domestic yeah, violence? Yeah, it's, and, you know, uh, it's different than our own. And the critical one is getting the woman to admit there's violence and then helping her plan. If the male is violent, oh my God! Perpetrator. You're I back. Don't know. Yeah, the perpetrator. You're back to the horrendous problem of basically the violent individual, and uh, I think yeah, that, and uh, the consequences. You know, there's a anger management, probably anger management. Safety, and then the yeah. issue of when you get into legal issues of if you 
great confidence and the person really is not that badly off to come back and sue you. There's certain difficult areas that we don't have. Each case is going to be different. Yeah. And seek consultation, seek, yeah. and by the way, seek supervision throughout your career. Right. Don't try to do it all alone. That's right. Get help, talk to other professionals. Excellent. Uh, guys, before we wrap up, um, is there anything you'd like to um, just say, some final words to our students that have attended the webinar and those that are going to watch it later on? Well, well we're, de we're delighted to be here. Um, to be here. Hope you're enjoying the book. We always appreciate your feedback. Uh, if there's things that you think uh, could improve the book, we're always working on a new edition. Um, I don't know if you have any questions about it, I think our email address is there in the book. Yeah. Ask us questions by email. Sure. Uh, and then I guess it. I would say is my final words, listen, 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 and Mary probably And listen some more. <laughs> listen some more. Yeah. And, and good luck in your field of pounds. It's a wonderful oh, field. Man. It's so rich and so full and so wonderful. We've enjoyed it for years and years. Yeah. Yeah. And I say, by the way, in the United States, uh, it's mm -hmm. really, really clear now. I think it's probably true in Australia. They simply are enough. Not enough psychiatrists or psychologists to fill the mental health needs, yeah. and counselors are going to become increasingly important. I also reckon. Oh, my final word is join the Australian Counseling Association. Right. Uh, be a true professional. We published in there a couple of times. To be a true professional, they are the ones that's going to advance you. Uh, I know that they're working very hard to provide licensure. They're yeah. into in, with Canberra all yeah. the time, supporting you. Join the Australian Counseling Association and tell Phil Armstrong I said that. <laughs> he is a wonderful man. He'll be great. <laughs> and by the way, you're lucky to be working with Simon and Pedro because they are super people and we love them too. Oh, stop. We love us. Thanks a lot.